Okay guys, and welcome to the Big Table Method in NMR, also known as Combined Techniques. So what I'm going to do, go through today is quite an elongated method. This would definitely be a, a very points-heavy question in an exam for how to deduce a molecule based on different graphs. So we've got mass spec, IR, carbon NMR, and hydrogen NMR. And I think the most important thing to realise about this type of question which, if you look at past papers, has been up to 10 marks and more. As they're doing leveled questions, yours will probably be six or so, but could be up to 10 marks on this. The most important thing to realize is that when they ask the question, although the question says deduce the molecule or find the molecule responsible, most of the marks aren't for finding a molecule. What it'll then say is explain your reasoning or justify your answer something like that. Almost all of the marks are not for getting the molecule, but for proving it's that molecule. So I always use the analogy, you've got to imagine you're a lawyer trying to convict someone of murder. My dad. So if you had a bloody footprint, a smoking gun, and some DNA evidence, you wouldn't just use the smoking gun, would you? Even though that might be enough on its own to convict them, you'd still give all the evidence. That would be better as a lawyer. Same as this, we're trying to convict the molecule of being responsible for these graphs. So we need to give as much evidence as possible, even if it's already obvious that that is the molecule. So that's the mindset to have. So there's a model answer up here with a little bit extra on the end. I'll have to rub the graphs off to put on when I've got a bit more, a bit more space. So the first thing to look at is the empirical formula. Just look at it and look at which elements are in there. So, okay, hydrogens, carbons, oxygens, no nitrogens, that's good, that means that's going to help us narrow down our choices. So, we're not going to write anything down about that, we're just going to be aware of it. The first thing we're going to write down is we're going to look at our mass spec graph, and we're going to look at our molecular ion peak, which is the peak furthest to the right, the heaviest peak. And we can see that the M plus peak is 88, and this tells us that the MR of our molecule is 88. You have now got yourself one mark. If you just said MR is 88, nil point. Because you've said what we know, but you've not given the evidence for how we know it. It's like saying, Bob did the murder because I said so. We need evidence. And the evidence is the M+. Plus. Incidentally, if you just said M+, plus and then didn't say MR, well, that doesn't tell us anything. So together, they get us one mark. We then can find our ratio of molecular formula MR to empirical, and that is 88 over, let's just add that up, 44, which comes to 2. This tells me my empirical formula, well, my molecular formula, sorry, is twice as big as my empirical. I always imagine the molecular formula as a pizza, and empirical formulas as slices of that pizza. How many slices of empirical formula are in the pizza? Two. So my molecular formula must be twice my empirical C4H8O2. We're pretty much done with mass spec for now. We'll come back to that graph right at the end. The next logical thing to move on to is the infrared. And doing it in this order actually helps because now we know our molecular formula, that's going to help us choose the correct bonds for the infrared. For example, the fact I've got oxygens in there, two oxygens, that's going to give me clues as to what bonds to have. If I only had one oxygen, I can't have two or three different types of oxygen bond, can I? So we do infrared next. So if you've got a data sheet, I would definitely get the data sheet out so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. If you haven't, just type in OCR data sheet um, on, on the internet and you'll find it. It'll be the first or second hit and then print it off. So from our graph, I can see I've got a peak at about 3,000. And a lot of people would be tempted to say, if you look at the data sheet, that that is an OH peak. Because OH peaks do crop up around 3,000. I know that this is not an OH peak, though, because ah, it's sharp. I can stab myself in it. And all OH peaks are broad. I know on the data sheet it only says carboxylic acid OHs are broad. They're all broad. It's just carboxylic acids are especially broad. 
So the fact that this is sharp tells me it cannot be an OH peak, this must be a CH peak. And although you could write that down in your answer, you ain't gonna get a mark for it, because it doesn't help you decide what the molecule is. Everything's got a CH peak. Again, using the lawyer analogy, it's like saying, the person who committed the murder is the one with a head. Well, yes, probably, but doesn't really help us, does it? So I'm not gonna bother writing that down. We do, however, have a peak at about, what, 1,700? That's gonna be my carbonyl bond, C double O. So I'm going to write that down, and you can either write down the actual wave number or the wave number range from your data sheet. I'm just going to put the actual one down. And another peak about 1,200, that's going to be my C single O. So putting all those together, I can conclude, well, which functional group only has those bonds? It has to be an ester. I know it's not a carboxylic acid because there's no OH bond, and carboxylic acids have an OH. All we can get from that then, incidentally, we've got one mark here, probably one mark here, probably a mark there, probably a mark there. The mark schemes change slightly every year, but you certainly could get marks for that. We then move on to our carbon NMR, and that's just a two-column table. I'm going to first of all write down my chemical shifts, so 30 and 35-ish. You'll get a little bit of leeway on this, a little bit. What's that, like 67 and 175? And we're just going to play Snapsy. And the reason we do the carbon NMR after the mass spec and IR is because we're going to constantly look back and use this previous information to help us answer the carbon NMR, to pick the correct environment. So, one of 30. I don't know if you can see that there, could be a C to CL or a C to BR, but if we look at our molecular formula, we don't have any halogens, so can't be that one. Could be a C to N, but again, we don't have any nitrogens, so it's going to be a C to C. So it's almost like last man standing. You've got to get rid of the ones it couldn't be until there's only one left. And sometimes it'll just be obvious. So this is going to be a C to C, 35 will be a C to C, Bearing in mind it's an ester, I have to have a C2O bond, don't I? So we're going to have 67 will be C2O, and again, bearing in mind it's an ester, we have to have a C double O. So bearing that functional group in mind will be really, really helpful when you're trying to select those correct environments. And this will probably get you a mark as well. Now we come on to the bad boy, the hydrogen NMR. So far, we've got a lot of marks, but we're certainly not close to finding out what the molecule is. This is what tells us what the molecule really is, the hydrogen NMR table. And the first thing we're going to do is label our peaks from left to right. Why? Because the left is usually the easier peaks to identify, and so you can get easy marks. I've just realised I've not written the integration traces on, I'll just add those to the top now. So this was a 3, that was a 2, and that was a 3. So I just added the integration traces onto the top. So we're going to go through this graph, and the columns are peak, chemical shift, delta, annoyingly the same symbol as dipole, deal with it, environment, splitting, number of adjacent hydrogens, relative area, therefore number of hydrogens, Sometimes you'll see this called the integral or the integration trace. Same thing. It's like quilt and duvet. Two different words, but they mean the same thing. And then finally, conclusion. So we're going to go through this, and we're going to get down all the information we can from our peaks. So uh, roughly speaking, that's about, what, 4.7, uh, 2.4, 3.5, uh, again, you'll get a little bit of leeway, splitting. Definitely learn your splitting table is a singlet. If you don't learn your splitting table, you may as well stop the video now because you'll never get this. Quartet and triplet. Okay, and our integration traces or relative areas, three, two, three. 
Okay, so that's all the information down. Now what we're going to do is fill in these other three columns, and they kind of come in pairs. So those two are a pair, those two are a pair, and kind of these two are a pair as well. So again, we're going to play Snapsy, and we're going to remember all of our previous information. So I'm going to start at the bottom, 1.3, well, that's going to be a H to C to R. And incidentally, that R is a carbon, it means like a carbon chain, so just write, R, write a carbon, don't write R. Could be an OH and an NH, they crop up in the same place, but again, we don't have any OHs and NHs. Look, we can tell from the infrared. So that's going to help us select the correct one. So this is a H to C to C. We've also got a peak at 2.4. Well, again, let's play last man standing. Can't be an OH on NH, because we don't have those bonds. Can't be a H to C to N, because we don't have any nitrogens. OK, so we've got a C to H bond, so could it be this here, a benzene ring with a CH coming off? Well, no, because we've only got four carbons, and you need at least seven to have that environment. So it's going to have to be this carbonyl environment there, H to C to C to double O. And then the top one will be H to C to O. Next, we can look at our splitting and use this to find the number of adjacent hydrogens. So if you remember, if it's the N plus 1 rule, if you take the number of adjacent hydrogens and add 1, you will get the splitting. So you've got to kind of use the N plus 1 rule in reverse. So what number do I add 1 to to get a singlet? 1, 0. What number do I add 1 to to get 4? 3. What number do I add 1 to to get 3? 2. And so that is our number of adjacent hydrogens. Incidentally, for this column here, probably you'll get a mark. For this col these two columns here, probably a mark, maybe even two marks sometimes. Last column we're going to fill out is our conclusion, and our conclusion is a, so it's two really cool tricks which make this table badass. The first one is how we get this conclusion. What we're going to do here is build up a series of jigsaw pieces, and we're going to get that by combining the environment with this column here. But the first thing we need to do is check, is our relative areas, our in integrals, actually the number of hydrogens because a little kind of sneaky trick with relative areas is they are always the simplest whole number ratio so you should never see a relative area of six to three you won't get that that will be simplified to two to one you need to check whether your relative area has been simplified i like just to do a little total at the bottom three add two add three da, 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 carry the one the eight just check, is that the number of hydrogens you have? Yes, it is. Okay, we're good to go, we can just leave it like that. If for some reason this added up to four, so it's been simplified, clearly I need to double these numbers. So I would just write these numbers doubled next to it here. I like to put them in brackets to show that. That's not the case with this question. If you, I'm going to do two um, like practice questions after this. If you go to the second practice question um, and have a try at that after this video, you'll see that in action there. Okay, so these do represent our actual number of hydrogens, so I can leave it like that. Let's combine them. I know I have a H to C to O environment, and I know I have three hydrogens in that environment. Therefore, I have a H3 C to O. This is a jigsaw piece. This is a chunk of my molecule. Let's build up some more. H to C to C to double O, but two hydrogens in that environment, H2 C to C to double O. H to C to C, but three of them, H3 C to C. So my molecule consists of three jigsaw pieces. All we need to do now is figure out which order the jigsaw pieces go together in. And that's where the second trick comes in. I'm just going to have to clear my board a little bit. Get a bit more space. Okay. So the first trick 
combine the environment with the number of hydrogens to get our jigsaw pieces, our conclusion. Now what we're going to do is cross-link. And when we cross-link, we're going to look at these two columns here. The number of adjacent hydrogens and the relative area. I'm just going to write a little sentence down. Due to complementary splitting and relative area, dot, 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 dot. So, let's have a little look at this. The fact that I have a, let's start at the bottom one, let's go from the bottom. The fact that I have two adjacent hydrogens here tells me that on the carbon next door, there are two hydrogens. Okay, let's have a look. Which of these environments has two hydrogens in it? That one. So that means this one must be next to that one. So this is called a slash link. But we're not doing slash linking, we're doing cross linking. So it works like this. If Bob is stood next to Sally, would you agree that Sally must be next to Bob? It's not like Bob can be next to Sally but Sally is not next to Bob. They have to be next to each other. It has to work both ways. So we need to check it works both ways. This environment, this jigsaw piece is next to two hydrogens. This jigsaw piece has two hydrogens. This jigsaw piece is next to three hydrogens. This jigsaw piece has three hydrogens. Do you see the cross? That tells us these two jigsaw pieces are next to each other. And incidentally, you can only put the cross between two different environments, not three or four. The cross has to be between a maximum of two environments, or exactly two. So, due to our complementing splitting and relative peak area, we can say that this environment here is next to this environment here. And when you're putting your jigsaw pieces together, often they overlap. So you see this carbon here? That is this carbon here. We're saying we've got a CH3 next to a carbon. Here's the CH3, it's next to a carbon. The carbon it's next to is that carbon. So we've slotted them together, but again, they often slightly overlap. Again, this will get you a mark, and there'll be a mark, maybe even two marks here for your conclusion, for your jigsaw pieces. All we need to do now is add on the jigsaw pieces, which we haven't managed to get through cross-linking, to get our final answer. And incidentally, when you're doing it like at home or you're practicing in lesson, definitely do do the cross-link, that's fine. I wouldn't do it in an actual exam especially if you have to cross-link like two or three times, it's just going to become a mess. So when you get good at it, you can just do it in your head. The, don't actually write the cross down. Also, incidentally, one extra thing, a singlet will never cross-link because, by definition, a singlet has no hydrogens next door. So there's no peak next door. If it is next to a carbon, the carbon doesn't have any hydrogens on it. So you shouldn't ever cross-link a singlet. So, now I've got my most of my molecule. Let's finish it off. I'm not going to add on to this molecule, well, this part molecule, because this is my working out, and look, that got me a mark. I want a mark for my working out and one for my final answer, not just one for the final answer. So I'm going to draw this out again. And I'm going to add on my final jigsaw piece, again remembering all the previous information. So remembering it's an ester, well, the oxygen must go here. Two safety checks to make sure this is the correct molecule. Just double check the splitting. This is next to two, so it should be a triplet. Yeah, it's a triplet. This is next to three, so it should be a quartet. Yeah. This is next to nothing, and so it should be a singlet. Yeah. So it does fit. The second check, you don't need to write that down, that's just something for you to do in your head. The second check we do need to write down, I'm definitely going to have space here, I'll just kind of draw it in a box here. 
The last and final check we need to do is going all the way back to the start and looking at the mass spec graph again. And we're going to look at those fragment ions. So my fragments are 15 and 29. The rule is you can break one bond. In reality, sometimes more than one can break. But for our example, one bond. So one bond can break to snap off a chunk with the correct mass, a fragment. So if I was to break this bond here and have CH3, that would be 15. On a different molecule, if I was to break this bond here and have CH3, CH2, that comes to 29. So yes, I could make those fragments, therefore that is evidence that I've got the right answer. If you can't snap off a chunk with the right M over Z, with the right mass, you haven't got the right molecule. So rejiglificate it and try and get it in a better way. And the splitting should work too. And very finally, I've lost a mark for these fragments. Everybody always forgets this. Don't forget, they need a positive charge. Uh, a mark for that. And depending on how complicated this is, maybe one or two marks for that as well. So definitely a, a mark heavy question there. For the last 10 years, there has not been an organic exam where they haven't given you a big form of this question. Maybe not with all four graphs, but certainly with two or three. So it is something you need to practice.